Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now for the past few days I've been using this, the E5 2683 V4. This is of course a Xeon chip that dates back to 2016. It has 16 cores and 32 threads and you can find them on eBay or AliExpress for very little money. An appropriate title for this video would be 16 cores for $16 or $1800 CPU now costs just 18 either of those would be applicable depending on where you purchase it from and at what price now of course as a Xeon CPU back in 2016 it would have probably passed over your head if you were a gamer there was no need to purchase one of these when something like an i7 5820k would have offered similar gaming performance at a fraction of the price and of course that made more sense as a traditional desktop CPU. But you know me, I love a used Xeon, so I just had to purchase one of these. And for the last few days, I've been using it happily in my X99A motherboard with 32 gigs of quad channel 2400 MHz DDR4. So would I recommend one? Well, let's talk about that. Now, one of these old Xeons has dropped significantly in price, and that is the most tempting factor. This one in particular, the E5 2683 V4, well, it's pretty locked down. The multiplier is locked. We can make a few tweaks to the BCLK settings, but you're not really going to get much from it. And I found that any adjustments just made my system totally unstable. I sort of like that in a way, though, that, you know, there's no pressure to overclock it. You could buy one of these, buy a cheap x99 ball and then just use it without having to think oh can i push it a little bit further i just slapped it in my x99a board set the ram to 2400 megahertz it booted straight away and we were in windows before you know it now the first thing that really did surprise me when using one of these was actually that it wiped the floor with my i5 24 12400F, sorry, in the multi-course in a bench test. It actually scored almost 200 points higher in the multi-core result, which does seem impressive. Um, but ultimately, when it came to that single core result, it certainly fell short. And this is primarily where the Xeon stands out in terms of that multi-core or multi-threaded performance. This is very much a strength in numbers type deal. 16 cores and 32 threads just brute force their way to the top of the uh, leaderboard as far as the Cinebench scores are concerned, despite the age of the chip. When it came to practical scenarios like rendering a video in DaVinci Resolve, um, it was about five seconds slower than my i5-12400F, which I think is still very impressive. I mean, I could happily use this on a daily basis. I will say that it didn't feel as snappy as a modern CPU, just navigating around the operating system, opening up Chrome or whatever, or just random programs that was it lacked a certain snappiness this is what i expected and it's what i often see with these cpus it definitely would be better suited to an older operating system in my opinion but for the price really difficult to complain now of course you're probably thinking xeon's going to be an expensive platform um but honestly you can find a cheap motherboard on aliexpress as well a cheap x99 one preferably one with quad channel memory of course to squeeze the best performance out of this but there are certainly better options available to you for gaming in 2023 and ones that aren't going to cost as much. It's still very much an enthusiast's platform, I believe. Now, the point of this one wasn't to compare it to the i5-12400F. However, my intentions were to simply swap out the i7-5820K in my X99A board for something a little snappier when it came to rendering. Um, and this certainly did that. I mean, when it came to comparing the i7 results, again, it wiped the floor more so with that chip but what about gaming well let's get into that right now and talk about what it's like to use one of these older 16 core 32 thread cpus for running modern titles i paired the xeon e5 2683 v4 with the 3060 ti which would have definitely been better suited to 1440p gaming and in fact while the gpu usage was a lot higher with that we still saw some instances whereby the cpu was a limiting factor so the xeon e5 2683 v4 boosts to three gigahertz max on just two of the cores i believe anything after four cores and you're looking at 2.6 gigahertz 2600 megahertz and that is what we saw in this footage 
I've thrown up some comparative results to the i7-5820K at stock, which is the CPU I'm replacing. But of course, keep in mind that that can be overclocked with relative ease, and we can squeeze more frequency out of the memory as well. I'm using 3000 megahertz here, which was actually limited to 2400 megahertz with this chip. At least I couldn't get it to boot any higher with this board. The first game is Cyberpunk, and as you can see, the Xeon hit 74 FPS on average with decent percentile lows. It is these percentile lows specifically that are improved most of the time when using something with a ridiculously high core count in comparison to the older i7. Counter-Strike 2 scored over 200 frames per second with the Xeon, and the percentile lows did suffer a little bit, but ultimately the game was still very smooth. Interestingly, this one performed a lot better with the i7 in terms of those percentile numbers with 92 and 61 respectively, but the average was a little bit lower. I'm going to assume that this is definitely more sort of single thread heavy, so because the i7 is better in terms of that single core performance, it's doing better in terms of those percentile figures. The Witcher 3 up next, the next gen version of the game. Of course, ultra preset with TAAU. The Xeon hit 90 frames per second with a 1% low of 51 and a 0.1% low of 35. Again, the i7 performed very closely here, 90 frames per second on average, but this time the percentile lows were improved. So again, this is what I mean by not really a gaming CPU. The extra cores and threads certainly do help out in some scenarios but not all of them and I think the age of the platform as well is probably to blame when it comes to some of these newer titles but there we go. At this resolution 1080p which I've been using for today's tests as well you'll notice that the CPU is the limiting factor because the GPU usage is quite low in some instances, meaning that it can't hit its full potential because there is a limitation somewhere. In that case, it is the processor. 39 FPS in Starfield here, which matches the i7, and the percentile lows were a little bit better, particularly that 0.1% figure, which I think is where it counts, especially when it comes to Starfield, which will struggle a little bit on certain CPUs in busier town areas. Red Dead Redemption 2, 101 FPS with the Xeon and 3060 Ti, and some very respectable percentile lows, 76 and 66 respectively. This was better in every way than the i7 at stock, but remember, as I said before, this can be overclocked. I think that gap will close a little bit. The extra cores and threads certainly do help when it comes to rendering, which is what I mainly do, um, but when it comes to gaming, yeah, you're going to be just fine if you're using this platform and you have an older i7, 5820K for example, which again, they can also be found for very little money. It's the motherboard which is going to cost you the most. Spider-Man Remastered to finalise here. The Xeon did massively better in my opinion, 90 frames on average compared to 77. The percentile lows were 52 and 35 compared to 49 and 31. So not much difference in terms of those figures, but on average, much better for the Xeon in this one. All in all though, it's gonna be quite an evenly matched affair with percentile lows going each way in favor of each chip depending on the game at hand. And that concludes our video. I've had fun with the E5 2683 V4. It'll be staying in my X99A motherboard because I think it's just fascinating you can buy 16 core 32 thread CPUs for like less than 20 quid. With all that said, thank you very much for watching. Just a quick update on my sort of secondary PC upgrade here. Uh, if you enjoyed this one, leave a like, leave a dislike if you didn't. Let me know if you're still using a chip like this down below in the comments. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and you want to, of course. And hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.